Welcome to Luminosity. Uh, this is the very last day um, of our week-long event that has nearly killed me. Um, it, it's been much more successful than we uh, thought it would be. We've had quite a few thousand people come through the exhibition. Um, and I encourage all of you after tonight's talk to wander around up here, but also to wander around downstairs, particularly to the very end of this building, uh, which is very, very beautiful indeed. Um, Luminosity is largely about us showing Sydney and New South Wales that we are very big and very good, um, and I hope we've been successful in doing exactly that and putting up a very large exhibition of student work over an extended period of time, you know, talking to the schools, doing this sort of stuff all in one program. And I hope is, in fact, it will, I think, change the image that some people have of New South Wales, of the built environment at New South Wales. Um, so, let's talk about this evening. Um, this evening, uh, the running order will be, well, me talking first of all, and then I'll introduce tonight's guest speaker, uh, Professor John Hunter from the University of Cardiff. Immediately after that, there will be a few questions, and then I'll introduce Bill Randolph, our, um, our ADR, our Associate Dean Research, uh, to chair a panel discussion on urban design. Okay. And since this is the very last event of Luminosity, um, Alexander Sardine will then uh, essentially close the, uh, close the event down for this year. Um, and after that, there'll be some drinks and caps and so on. So let me encourage you yet again to, to wander around, go downstairs, have a look at the student work, have a look at what we've been doing at Built Environments in New South Wales. Okay. Um, let me begin by talking about um, our speaker tonight. Our speaker tonight is Professor John Hunter, uh, who many of you, I think, will know because he's been to Sydney before and has actually written some really important things about urban design and planning in New South Wales and in Sydney. Currently, he's a professor of urban design at Cardiff University in Wales, but he's held a number of positions in a number of different places, including, I'm going to have to read this, I'm afraid, um, he taught urban studies at York University in Toronto. Um, he's been involved in planning and land management and development at Reading University. He is involved in environmental uh, planning at, at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Um, and as I said earlier, his current position is um, as head of urban design at the University of, um, of, of Cardiff. He is a member of the Urban Design Group, a founder member of the Academy of Learned Societies for the Social Sciences, and an honorary friend of the Royal Society of Architects in Wales. He was a director of the Design Commission for Wales and chair of its design review panel from 2002 to 2012. Um, and he has wide ranging interests in urban design and urban planning. Um, and um, he has also written, I think, one of the most interesting things that has ever been written about urban design in Sydney. And I'm just trying to, it was, it, it's, it's an article, but it's the longest article I think most of you would have ever seen. At least 100 and what, 20, 30, or maybe 200 and something pages. Um, and I wrote down the name, I've just forgotten it. I apologize. Anyway, I think we should uh, give a great welcome to, to John Punter. John. Thank you very much, Alan. It's a great pleasure to be uh, in Sydney. Um, I had a sort of one semester sabbatical in Sydney back in 2002, uh, and it was uh, one of the best things I've ever done, really, because I found the city absolutely gripping in terms of its uh, environment. The, its history of planning was even more interesting. Um, I read some great uh, stuff. I had wonderful colleagues who used to knock on my door. James Werrick, who can't be here tonight. Um, John Lang, uh, Sandy Cuthbert. You know, there's two giants of urban design whose you know, books line our shelves and we give to our students to read. So the whole MUD program was a revelation to me. And Rob Freestone gave me the kind of uh, the lowdown on much of the planning. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very, very fruitful time and I had a great time walking the city. So it's, it's wonderful to be back, and it's wonderful to see UNSW, you know, uh, punching its weight, really, when I look around at what's on the walls. 
uh, uh, both upstairs and downstairs. I think it's a tremendous tribute to uh, the school and to those who worked so hard to, to, to achieve this. Uh, this whole exhibition is a great end of year uh, event and I hope it will continue into the future. But I'm here tonight to talk to you about the, um, the English urban renaissance um, between 19, uh, 1999 to 2012 and uh, it's, I've subtitled it The Rise and Demise of Urban, uh, urban Design Quality because I think that's, uh, it's pretty much what happened. And it's not just because the Conservatives have come in in 2010 and uh, wiped out so much of uh, the, the policies and things that uh, the, um, that the Labour, new Labour government had produced, but it's because of the failures within the, system, within the Renaissance itself. So I want to reflect on those. I think they have great importance, not just to the UK or to England, but to uh, the problem of planning and, and urban design generally. So that's what I'll talk about. Um, it was agreed that I talk for an hour, um, so I will try to be as quick and as, uh, uh, so we, as, as speedy as I can uh, to, to do that. So, um, otherwise it's a bit death by PowerPoint, I think. So uh, I'm just warning you in advance, you can leave now, uh, sl silently walk away if you wish. So let's um, kick things off by just looking at the uh, four publications here. Um, this one is the original task force report, Richard Rogers' task force, uh, with many distinguished academics, uh, but particularly professionals on it. And they produced a great tome, uh, which has uh, done the circuit, really, of the, of the world, I would say. And then in 2005, when things were not going particularly well, they wrote towards a strong urban renaissance, um, which was trying to sort of paper over the, not paper over the cracks, to try and find the weaknesses in the system and to restructure it. So in 2009, on the eve of the uh, uh, death of, the, of New Labour, really, we wrote our um, urban design in the British Urban Renaissance, which was a very interesting structure because we asked an academic to write a paper and present a paper. We then asked a professional uh, to criticize it. We then asked the, someone from the local government administration to offer their comments. And finally, we had in the audience uh, a very good bunch of activists. And we did this for the 16 cities uh, in the UK. I'm only going to talk about England tonight, but they gave us so much material, uh, really enough to last a lifetime. So it was a very, it was a very enjoyable um, uh, project to uh, undertake. Um, I'm going to try to focus on just four elements, really. The National Urban Design Policy Framework, which I think is very relevant to Australia, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. The second point, the housing location, quantity, quality, sustainability, because that was the undoing, really, of the Renaissance. Somehow along the line, we, we didn't pay enough attention to the quantity particularly. Uh, and then thirdly, the public realm and uh, urban environmental improvement, which of course is probably the focus of much urban design thinking uh, and is particularly important to us. And then finally, the question of skills and resources and the whole structure and the way in which local government behaves uh, because that's critical to making progress in, in a planning sphere. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about. And then in the second half of the, of the presentation, I'll just be showing the evidence really, the city by city variations with a largely pictorial, the uh, principal failings, I'll focus a bit on those, and if I have time, I'll just talk about how the Conservatives eviscerated the policies and what they put in their place. So it's quite a, uh, a challenge to get all this done. And I begin with um, an interesting observation, really, on the, um, the criticisms of the urban renaissance, which came right in at the beginning. People like Patsy Healy said it was a sort of architectural um, preoccupation, architectural determinism. Um, Peter Hall said it was uh, European urban romanticism uh, a la Barcelona, and there was a lot of Barcelona in the original report. Um, even Ivan Turek at Glasgow said that, you know, the consumption-led revival that would predicate it, if really, the uh, task force on, uh, would, would not work. David Locke said, 
you know, where are the suburbs? Why aren't you talking about the suburbs? It's where every, all the families live. Um, Loretta Lee said it will be a gentrifier's charter. How right she was. Um, the question of social justice versus competitive individualism, uh, Ash Amin mentioned uh, as a major question really for the Renaissance. And finally, Alison Rivette put her two pennies worth in saying, I thought environmental quality was a result, uh, not a determinant of urban success. So all of those, I think, were really, really important criticisms that uh, were not, understandably, were not, not heeded. Um, because what happened was that the professionals, planning, architecture, urban design, local government, environmentalists, were just so pleased to have the new Labour government saying, look, this is a job for local authorities, and they've got to succeed, they've got to deliver. Um, so that sort of sets the background for uh, the... Uh, a, a, a discussion of what the uh, urban renaissance is all about. I think its first and most important and probably its major achievement was that it provided a, um, co a comprehensive uh, national urban design framework for the first time built within the planning system and um, a new plan-led system with very clear, um, relatively clear uh, prescriptions for what the uh, strategy should say. It should be a very strategic document, a very visionary document, shouldn't get bogged down too much in detail. But to, to supplement it, there should be a great deal of supplementary planning guidance, which uh, would be produced particularly by, by CABE. And CABE really is um, at the heart of the story because CABE replaced the very um, autocratic Royal Fine Art Commission, the very aristocratic uh, Royal Fine Art Commission. And CABE uh, built itself uh, an empire very, very quickly, from 20 staff to 120 in a matter of um, t uh, about t t 10 years, I would say. So that by 2009, it was uh, really, really strong. And one of the most interesting things about it was it was making urban design academics completely irrelevant because the... Uh, CABE could produce something in two or three months that was very substantive, very expert, right on the button, um, and it, we just couldn't compete with that. So it was a very a tremendous shot in the arm, really, to the, uh, the whole growth of, of urban design thinking. Um, we also had in the urban design framework um, a very strong low-carbon green infrastructure um, agenda, the Code for Sustainable Homes was introduced as a kind of building regulation refinement, updating, uh, and that certainly progressed uh, very quickly. And the placemaking agenda, um, the idea of corporate, corporate local government placemaking uh, was very strongly in, enshrined with a strong public participation element. So all of these things, I think, were important. And then the more conventional things, like the... Um, Let's improve the efficiency of development control. You know, you hear that everywhere. Uh, it's always a key issue. Um, and uh, so that was inevitable. And one of, the, one of the problems right from the outset was that the new development plans were not really understood by, the, um, by local government. And that meant that the delivery of plans was very, very slow. And with a plan-led system, if you don't have a plan, then you, don't, you can't implement any kind, other kinds of strategies, etc. So I think that was, uh, that was a critical, um, critical problem from, from the outset. CABE produced a great deal of work. Um, the, this is just a sample of, of, uh, of the new documents which now grace everybody's shelf. The um, by design was written essentially by the Conservatives. It took four years for them to produce it. Uh, and by the time they came to publish it, CABE had to edit it. So it's CABE edited, but not CABE written. But this is a testament that the Conservatives were thinking about quality, at least, and urban design was becoming a buzzword for them. We had work on intensification of suburbia. We had a great deal of work on uh, the manual for streets, getting the highway engineers to talk to each other uh, and to talk particularly to planners and urban designers. We had um, work on the council, councillors and um, how to get design quality into development control. 
We had building for life criteria, which were part of um, what are the criteria by which we'll judge housing quality. Uh, that was very successful. And those sort of CABE fostered and government uh, fostered publications were paralleled by the profession looking at design policy, the urban design group looking at design guidance, and English partnerships um, and the housing corporation coming together, social housing and development facilitation, to do their compendium of urban design. So, you know, these are the books that students now read. Uh, and textbooks are, are in some senses out of the window, uh, and quite rightly so, because the, the quality and the speed at which these were produced uh, was really uh, remarkable. So we didn't get many plans. The plans we got sort of showed us that there were new things happening. Um, this is the Plymouth plan, which is a sort of city-wide city uh, good analysis of context, very, very simple policies, um, but looking across the whole city. Ashford is one of the rare examples where you can find a um, new development plan which is very positive about growth. What you can see here are six or seven major new extensions to the town centre, uh, and that, was a very, that could be very effective. In Bristol, um, where the boundaries of the city are largely controlled by surrounding authorities, what we see is a neighbourhood intensification, neighbourhood centres programme, new transit lines trying to connect those with the city centre. And in Westminster, we have the kind of classic situation of virtually everything is a conservation area, except the royal parks, which of course are conservation anywhere. And then these small red areas, which are crossrail stations, railway stations, derelict sites, where a massive intensification of development can take place. But these are four of the kind of new generation of plans uh, which promised to be very effective, but really uh, didn't deliver in that way at all. What there was also happening at the same time was that cities were beginning to think about much more detailed design strategies and things to underpin the uh, development framework. So these are two good examples, Nottingham in particular, with what they call, they misleadingly call a city centre master plan, but a kind of clear idea of where major development was going to go in individual locations, which is very rare in a British discretionary system. And then somewhere like Bristol, which was picking up on the public realm and talking about the way in which they could pedestrianise large chunks of the city, um, get much more priority to public transport and confine the uh, cars to the outer edge of the city centre where there would be appropriate parking. So these were the sort of some of the new ideas that were being put forward. Now the problem was, as I say, the local development frameworks, only 12% had developed strategies five, by five years later. 63% today have, have, got have got frameworks, but they're not all approved. So the slow plan making process was very difficult. And it was part of the reflection that local authority leadership was very reluctant to prioritize planning and design. They were uh, very stuck in their existing uh, patterns of, of behavior. There was very little front-loading of consultation on the development frameworks, and the, the opposition which it, these generated within the, the wider community was very significant. Um, and it wasn't until 2008 that the, uh, the late new Labour government said we need to do something about public participation and to front load it uh, very clearly. So that was uh, a problem that was dealt with, but, but too late really for the system to really work. Um, the number of proactive plan-led policy-backed design regimes, uh, plan-led policy-backed policy design sensitive, was comparatively rare. I've shown you four previous examples. Otherwise, it tended to be those cities um, which had already established a reputation for urban design. So they were well equipped technically to do that. Um, but otherwise, what we found was uh, quite a skills deficit in control policy and enhancement that, that, uh, that uh, didn't allow the kind of corporate work working which the uh, task force had hoped. So, and the local planning authority planners often complain that there are too many CABE publications being produced. They couldn't keep up with them. They couldn't... Um, uh, 
they couldn't digest them and decide how to implement them. And there was anyway, at the same time, a hemorrhage of talent to the private sector, as there always is in a development boom. So with city, cities and districts were losing some of their most skilled people. So it was a very steep learning curve, really, towards higher densities, intensification, uh, improvement of the public realm. These are all, in a sense, new things that the local authorities were all now having uh, to deal with. So the impact of CABE locally was, I think, um, questionable. But because it didn't direct itself primarily towards uh, the local authorities and the planning regime. But from most other points of view, the work of CABE was, was fantastic. Now, the second kind of um, key issue I need to address is housing supply, affordability, quality, and sustainability. Because this was really where the, the um, urban renaissance shot itself in the foot. Um, it began with a very good uh, relationship uh, between the um, homes, the formation of the Homes and Communities Agency, which put together the um, English partnerships, development facilitators, with the social housing providers. So there was a positive instrument for social inclusion and also for improved supply of housing. Um, very quickly, CABE got stuck into the quality of housing. And with their new Building for Life criteria, they began to measure uh, the quality of development. And they came to conclusions by midterm 2005-06 that most development was very mediocre. Very little was very good. And 29% was certainly poor. So the supply of housing and the quality of housing began to work against each other, really, in terms of, you know, well, what do you want? Do you want us to build quickly? Do you want us to build uh, high quality? There was no doubt where, where Cave stood on that. Um, and indeed, most people were looking for an improvement in, in design quality. Um, so good residential design practices were certainly established. Design charrettes, master plans, codes, you know, pedestrian-dominated layouts, the kind of thing that I was studying in 2002 in, when I was in Western Australia, the Liverpool Neighbourhoods Programme. That kind of thing was, became a, a major part of uh, what, uh, what we were implementing in the UK. The Code for Sustainable Homes was introduced, moving towards progressive zero carbon by 2016. But of course, not only were, they, was the, were the house builders being asked to improve the quality, they were now also being uh, asked to improve the sustainability, the energy efficiency of, of buildings. Um, so all of those things really were part of how the house builders um, began to think, well, you know, everyone's being very critical of us. Um, we're asked, being asked to produce more affordable and more expensive um, insulation, etc. So, um, you know, they weren't really playing ball uh, in the way in which had way, way which had been anticipated. So there was a very slow increase in, in supply. And it wasn't until 2008 that Gordon Brown woke up to that problem following the Barker report and said, look, we have to boost. We won't get re-elected unless we boost private supply and the, the supply of affordable housing. So that was something that was done very much at the last moment. If it had been done four years earlier, it might well have been different and critical, but it wasn't. So the boost to supply was very short-lived. And throughout the period, we never really reached the, growth, the rate of growth of household uh, consumption, which the task force had really wanted to, really focused on, said, we've got to deliver these 230,000 houses a year. So we did see some success with the level of affordable housing, which was delivered as part of planning gain. But it was quite clear that that 33% that was being delivered was also tending to drive density up and design quality down. And that was particularly evident in the massive high-rise apartments that were built, uh, which was half of all production, built around the edge of existing city centers uh, by 2007. And that became a kind of speculative bonanza for people to not to, um, to, to push up the price by using them for buy-to-let. So the rental market boomed short for a short period, 
but buying apartments became, uh, it kept the cost of apartments up when they should have been uh, being re significantly reduced. There were two big elements in terms of the public sector. A decent homes program of renewal on all the major public housing estates, which was very successful, but far less successful was the council estate regeneration program, which was a very slow process and with significant privatization of the best stock um, so that there was, th many of these schemes have only now started under a conservative regime and they will take the credit for, for that, I suppose. Um, but it will be interesting to see how those things pan out because the future is no, by no means certain. So here are the two graphs, really, which are really critical. And you can see that you know, our housing had been bubbling along at about 150,000. It dropped to, dropped to uh, 140. And then in the Renaissance, it began to increase. So that by um, 2008 here, it was getting up towards uh, two, over 200,000. So if we'd maintained that tra trajectory, we would have been uh, finally meeting our targets. But of course, it never happened. The crash in 2009 led, has led to a 50% reduction in production, so that has made the situation indisputably worse. And it's not Labour's fault, but what is Labour's fault really is not restoring um, a, a public housing programme uh, when it came into office, um, and its failure to, boot, to really boost the housing association supply, uh, the sort of third, third sector housing. Um, really has been a major problem. So that all the things that might have countered the inevitable gentrification of shortage of supply were never really implemented. And that's become a basic problem for uh, the, con in the contemporary era. So in the just looking at a couple of examples, Manchester, um, we've got good and bad really in terms of uh, lots of city centre housing uh, adjacent to hotels, but it very quickly... Uh, became instead of the kind of uh, the mixed use public space um, new lively city centre we get into very overdeveloped uh, projects where the communal space has disappeared where there's very little space between the um, uh, the rows of, of buildings uh, and then in the private sector in the in the uh, suburban sector we have a situ sorry we have a situation where um, we get more of the same, but the quality of uh, much of this housing uh, leaves a lot to be desired. The park hasn't been developed by the local authority. It looks like there's a missing community element here. Parking, the reduced parking standards, which have been part of compact development, um, and the inevitable neo-vernacular uh, housing design meant that many of these sorts of schemes were failing completely on the CABE scale. So house builders were being asked to do something completely different. Uh, and they stuck really to this kind of formula because this was where the, the incredible money, the, the very significant amounts of money were. So it was a very distinctive um, period really in terms of the pattern of development. Um, there were three other programs that were, signi that were significant or should have been significant. Um, as part of the attempt to divide to, to uh, drive uh, increased supply, we had a sustainable communities plan here, but as it turned out, was largely peripheral development um, on the edge of existing cities. And very quickly, critics were saying, this isn't sustainable. This is not uh, linked to, into the city centers, not part of the, uh, it's not, uh, hasn't got low energy. It has not got a high quantity of affordable. So. This was a, a program that was a uh, very strong failure. And then as part of balancing the books, the north of England had to have its housing market renewal areas in 2003. And these were similarly unsuccessful because the idea of renewing housing markets in areas of relatively declining population weren't going to work. Far more important and potentially useful was the Ecotown's proposal. But if, when this program was announced, these sites had not been through the local planning process. So they were sort of, the local community said, well, we're working on our local development framework. We haven't, uh, 
and within it is not a new eco-town. So there was furious opposition to the eco-town proposals, and they died a death. Um, and they're only gradually being re resurrected under different titles and different, um, different programs. Now, there were great successes. New Hall in Harlow, which was um, one of those within the Sustainable Communities Program, we have some very remarkable housing, largely because um, we have a very um, well-intentioned landowner who wanted quality, who recognized that the quality of the first piece of development would upgrade the returns on the second and third and fourth projects. It would set the standard, um, and so it proved. So we have an enlightened landowner, architectural competitions, master plan project, um, the master planner retained to vet the competition, etc., and very diverse products as a result of that. But this is very much the exception rather than the rule. In housing market renewal, we have the occasional um, urban splash project. This is Chimney Pot Place in, in Salford, where you, know, you have the kind of Coronation Street uh, facade, but uh, not chimneys, you have the uh, skylights to take light into, um, light into the center of the building, you have parking underneath at the back, and then you have the first floor of um, small gardens and the potential for quite a lot of social interaction. So there were good projects under housing market renewal, but there was also a lot of very unnecessary demolition and the quality of new, new build was really, really lacking. So that was, a, um, that, that was the part of the problem, really, uh, that we had to encounter. And then in estate regeneration, there were very much hallmark projects. But again, the, the problem here was that um, the regeneration contained a mix of retained properties, new private and social housing, uh, better school, um, and uh, extensive greening, as you can see, but the amount of affordable housing inevitably reduced so that um, you would still get uh, a, a significant component. But of course, what was 100% council housing maybe now is down to 35, 40%. So that was regarded as a gentrification program, uh, even though the new estates in some instances were uh, quite successful. So the critical weakness of of the second element, housing supply, was that it, um, there was inadequate supply, rapid price inflation, massive buy-to-let scandals, really. And um, the, the result was a strong critique of all the apartment developments uh, on design grounds and a strong social critique in terms of increasing gentrification, uh, etc. So there were very few low-carbon projects um, and what essentially happened was that as new supply decreased, um, the housing benefits bill increased so that the money that we would have put into building social housing has been reclaimed more and more by housing benefits bills. So this really difficult equity question uh, now confronts us. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it, it was one of the great tragedies, really, of the uh, Renaissance movement. The third thing I wanted to talk about, th third key element, is this emphasis on quality public realm. Um, there were major improvements in, in the city centre public realms particularly. Perhaps they were concentrated inevitably in central cities where walking became a, a major priority. Um, there were great benefits in the manual for streets because it brought the um, 20 mile per hour zone in, the home zone idea, uh, calming of arterium, arterial roads, um, the city streetscape challenge in central London. There are a lot of major, um, major new projects where the highway engineers work closely with planning authorities. Um, the London congestion charge was a great success, a 30% reduction in traffic, funding the bus network, reclaiming a lot of, creating a lot of public space for reclamation. Uh, Boris Johnson cut back the western half of it, unfortunately, and Labour refused or Labour failed to back similar campaigns in Edinburgh and Manchester. So we still have this sole example, but it's a very, very important example uh, of the way to go, really. Um, the problem of 
public realm was extended into ideas of green space. Um, a lot of heritage lottery money was diverted so that our parks were improved greatly, but the general success in terms of neighborhoods was actually quite difficult to manage, quite difficult to show. Um, and when I found this statistic that poor, unsatisfactory neighborhoods, neighborhoods reduced from 68 to 53 percent over the first half of the Renaissance, um, it seemed to me that that was a kind of a, a pyrrhic victory, if you like. But I guess actually a 15 percent change in a, those seven years could be regarded as very significant. So those were the um, aims, if you like, of the public realm. And there were huge improvements um, of which things like uh, Trafalgar Square was a, a kind of high class example. The finishing of the Birmingham spaces and the pedestrianization of central Birmingham, the pedestrianization of much of central Newcastle, um, the uh, rest restoration of the Peace Gardens and the Winter Gardens here in Sheffield, uh, a very important uh, development giving civility to uh, what would otherwise be quite cold spaces for much of the year. Um, so that was, they were all very positive elements. But the ideas of the task force, that you would have a network of public spaces connecting out into the periphery and into the green belt, areas of sort of um, green wedges that would run along watercourses, that would have cycleways and pedestrian routes, running tracks, suburban public spaces, all of those sorts of things. There was no statutory duty for, for, social, for green space programs. So none of those were realized. In the city centers, yes. And there were significant um, increases in walking and cycling and some public transport revival. But we didn't get the kind of comprehensive public realm strategy that New Labour had dreamed of. And that really was a, a major setback. Labour also led to produce this uh, st extraordinary stati statistic that closed circuit television became the way in which we controlled crime budgets. Uh, not only, they, it was that policing was a secondary function. Much of the crime budget went on this kind of activity. And the ASBOs, the antisocial behavior orders for policing, didn't produce any kind of significant, uh, really significant improvement on more rundown estates. So there was low improvement in the areas which needed it most, but significant improvement elsewhere. But not always significant improvement. These are two rather graphic examples. This is Bristol, where the Legible City Initiative had, of course, a long way to go in terms of clearing up the clutter uh, of, uh, that bedevils much urban design. Um, and this was Banks's response to uh, the one nation politics of new labor in terms of uh, CCTV was the way in which extraordinary growth in CCTV was now a major, major phenomenon. And then finally, an aspect, another critical aspect linking planning to urban design is the question of resources and skills for local government and regeneration. Um, there was, uh, there was some improvement, whoops, go back. There was some improved uh, funding. Um, let's go back. Oops, backwards. Yes. There was some improved funding, but not enough really to significantly increase the quality uh, of development. And the new ideas we had about development taxation were very, took a very long time to resolve. Now we have a situation where planning gain only asks for affordable housing. The community infrastructure le levy asks for infrastructure and the possibility of tax increment financing allows you to get some money up front but those things have only recently been sorted so they were never part of the uh, of the key agenda to give local authorities more money to advance their cause um, that wasn't reformed the value-added tax which would have helped rehabilitation and conservation a lot of unnecessary de demolition for that for that reason and a lot of commitment to better leadership and design, in, in design, so that the chief planner's status was supposed to have been restored and increased, that city mayors might, uh, might take that on. But in fact, the, the opposition from within local authorities put paid to those reforms. Um, and a positive use of land disposal powers 
didn't increase because compulsory purchase orders were always very cumbersome and difficult. So these resources and skills for local government became, again, one of the, the kind of millstones of, for uh, the local authority uh, and for the Renaissance as, as a whole. So no financial improvements. Local authorities found themselves in a position of ratcheting up land values by giving more generous planning permissions, setting undesirable development precedents. Um, there was a hemorrhage of talent to the private sector I've mentioned before. The wider skills challenge of upgrading planners was uh, not really met. Um, there was a lot of retrenchment to statutory functions after 2010, and positive environmental enhancement never had statutory funding. Uh, funding. And so the house builders in this sort of position where, you know, they were, where they were being continually attacked for uh, the failure of, uh, of their um, quality of development, um, they were also trying to resist social rent, low carbon and community provisions as unaffordable. And they have been concentrating since the demise of, of a new labor on restoring their balance sheets uh, because given their land holdings um, and the problems of reductions in value. So really there has not been uh, an equivalent kind of um, resourcing to drive an urban renaissance forward. And that has been a big problem. There is everywhere you go in Britain examples of an urban renaissance they're not hard to find. Um, this is kind of North London social housing, 40% you know, affordable. Um, communal children's play areas in the centre, underground car parking, incredibly rare in Britain. Sheffield Peace Gardens, a great civic, a new civic venture to restore, knocking down the old planning department and uh, creating uh, a major public space. The Millennium Bridge, connecting the Tate Gallery to St Paul's Cathedral leading to tremendous regeneration on the South Bank and new office areas on the South Bank. And then lowly barking in the middle of London's poorer eastern suburbs with a complete transformation of its city centre uh, with new public spaces, new affordable and private housing, uh, a great mix. So there are plenty of examples, but they're very much one-offs really in the, in the scheme of things. So we see a very differential urban renaissance with very spatial, varied spatial impacts within the cities. Uh, the city centres, a tremendous improvement. Uh, consumerist emphasis, yes, lots of new retail, but dramatic improvements in the public realm and dramatic repopulation to drive new businesses. A new dense apartment complex, complexes which help the population increase but don't produce uh, decent neighbourhoods, really. They're very much isolated, and where they touch the ground is deeply problematic. Um, good progress on, on the decent homes, but not on inner estate regeneration, much slower. So we get extensive gentrification, extensive studentification, and the buy-to-let um, element produces an increase in private rental. So. Um, instead of an increase in, 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 home on, in the home ownership pattern. And all of that, I think, is, uh, sounds a death knell, really. And it provide, helps me to provide a big city typology uh, of design commitment, which I'll go into in a moment. The last thing I will say is that one of the critical elements, and perhaps one of the areas which relates most to what's going on in Sydney, is the need for, sim for suburban intensification was um, very param was paramount in the early days of the urban renaissance. Uh, and certainly it reduced the amount of edge city development, but the, the NIMBY response, because suburban intensification wasn't written into to a not large number of new development plans, uh, the NIMBYs responded with a very, very strong um, uh, reaction against suburban intensification. And it, not so much NIMBY, uh, you understand what NIMBY is, not in my backyard. More bananas build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone, uh, I think is probably a better, um, uh, a b a better uh, statement, really, of, of the nature of, of the beast. So I, a four-point typology, um, which won't come as any surprise to you, because in some senses it re reflects historic patterns. But 
those that have managed to be strong, consistent design control, actively shaping development, then I think there are probably there are three I'm going to talk about very briefly. City of West, the City of Westminster, um, let's go back. City of Westminster, London Borough of Camden, um, and Nottingham. Nottingham was the great surprise, so much so that when we had the presentations, we thought it was a whitewash. We had to go back and reinvestigate it to discover no, Nottingham had was the most ordinary place which had made the most considerable advances in the quality of, of design. So the London Borough of Camden, we had excellent projects like King's Cross, which um, does have a good affordable housing component, has um, the canal restoration, has a new uh, educational complex in the middle, new arts complexes as well. It's an argent development, so the, new de the developer is an imp important part of that. New Square by Land Securities, also in Camden, was a very good piece of public realm um, on public, the publicization of the private realm. So this is essentially private space, but um, given complete public access. We had very widespread creation of shared space, removing traffic from areas like the northern areas of Covent Garden, um, but elsewhere we would have very intense uh, patterns of development, as here um, in the St. Giles Lorenzo Piano Project in St. Giles at the back of um, uh, just the northern edge of Covent Garden, or here at Paddington Station and Paddington Basin along the canal, very intense patterns of development. Um, this is the Trellick Tower, some of you will be familiar with it. Um, this, because it was largely privatised council estate, wasn't something they could clear. So we've been kept, we have, we're going to retain some of these great monuments of the, port, of the past, really, uh, as being uh, very significant elements in the social housing program. Nottingham, as I said, was probably the, the, the best example we had of a place which had taken on board the Renaissance, you know, and really delivered on it. And partly that's because it had money for things like it was given money for trams, and street improvements, the invisibility of the kind of tram infrastructure, I think, was a very great achievement. New City Square, uh, major conservation program, widespread pedestrianisation, improvement of the canal, new business districts on either sides of the city, the waterfront. And Nottingham achieved that because of its, the stability of its leadership, that it was already corporate. It had a clearly integrated strategy. It made design a priority and it brought to in the developers and the architects into that program. And CABE really put their weight behind Nottingham in a very, very positive way. So it's one of the shining examples, really, of that period. Much more common, really, is a sophisticated design controls, but being broken by entrepreneurial behavior, particularly by developers um, who were able to negotiate, or architects, really, able to negotiate exceptions. Manchester, Ian Simpson's uh, famous tower here, put paid to its world heritage status. Um, so the great icon of, uh, of the urban renaissance um, meant that the city didn't have that historic uh, designation that it really deserved by virtue of its well-restored Victorian architecture and its wonderful work it's done on restoring its canals and railway architecture as well. Um, I've already mentioned its apartments, its retail was re re rebuilt uh, following an IRA bomb. Uh, the new development was very sympathetic. In the, sub in the new suburban areas, there was a great emphasis on new architecture. Urban Splash again, um, Alsop's architecture, this is Chips in New Islington, um, bringing some very innovative thinking. Uh, but overall, a picture that's somewhat erratic uh, in terms of uh, wholesale improvement. Um, the City of London, well, the City of London, of course, is a century a corporation, a corporation, the City of London, so it is a complete uh, anomaly, really. Uh, it is, it's the kind of shining example, I suppose, of very good conservation, it's a Spitalfields, but also very heavy intensification in, in the commercial world. These are the low rise Broadgate towers. This was a particular good project which had this good edge to it, and it kept the market. Um, this is more typical of the kind of corporate space, 
that you get in, uh, in, in lieu of public space. But the City of London was obsessed with the new towers and new iconic buildings. Partly, of course, because it was competing with Canary Wharf. Um, partly because uh, there were always these small holes in the high tall buildings policy which allowed somebody, uh, some ambitious developer, um, to make a name for him or herself uh, in terms of the Heron Corporation here, uh, sorry, level 42, this one, um, and this is uh, Richard, uh, James Sellers building, uh, which is, you know, this is where Renzo Piano, all the kind of finesse that you, you associate in Sydney with Renzo Piano disappeared in a, a tower, a glazed tower. So um, some, some interesting, of course, this is, this is Southwark, um, this is not part of the City of London, but the City of London, uh, on the ground it's good, uh, in the air, of course, it can well be uh, something uh, quite different. And, of course, one has to remember that Canary Wharf was there as always as a competition. Canary Wharf is not part of the urban renaissance, but it is key because it introduced American master planning to, to England. Uh, and, and was a very positive addition in that sense. It also made legitimized design guidelines, proper design guidelines. And it's a rather, the, the good side of this is that although we, we are confronted today with the kind of, you know, mini Manhattan environment, and an environment which is um, totally controlled, you can't smoke in public spaces in, because uh, they're not public, in um, anywhere in Docklands, which most of us think, of course, is a good thing but it's an indication of the level of control. But what happens when you go into Docklands on a Saturday and Sunday is that the shopping mall, which is under, underneath us here, is entirely, entirely full of young people uh, of a multi-ethnic dimension. So the public spaces of Canary Wharf become intensively used on a, um, on a Saturday and Sunday by a completely different audience from that which is... Um, which normally occupies the suits, as I would call it, um, on the, at lunchtime and the evenings. So that's a kind of side swipe, really, at, um, at Canary Wharf. Um, but it is, in, in its own way, is quite an exemplar of, uh, of urban development um, and is something which has influenced the Renaissance movement. The London Borough of Southwark, um, it's a much poorer borough, uh, and it has been very entrepreneurial because it is interested, first of all, in getting rid of its major um, hardcore uh, estates of the period. This is a Lend-Lease project where 2,000 housing units is, are going to disappear. The population has already been decanted, decanted. Uh, Edinburgh, uh, the uh, uh, Elephant Castle development, which is a, a terrible eyesore. Um, so these are the sorts of really difficult projects they have to deal with it but they have been they have achieved some amazing um, planning gains in terms of affordable housing this is a 40 percent affordable in a uh, project which is open to pedestrian use the interior during the day but closes at night so this, these sorts of urban design projects have been quite inspirational less inspirational has been the um, what is laughingly called here the foster testicle the, um, the shard, so to speak, the great shard and London Bridge Station. Um, but again, it's very much a question of um, getting planning gain out of this that they can then lever into the improvement of hospitals, the creation of, of public housing. So I think places like Southwark have little choice um, to achieve things. Other cities, Liverpool and Sheffield, Newcastle, I'll just talk briefly about Liverpool and Sheffield, because they um, uh, are very significant. Liverpool is treading a tightrope, really, in terms of its potential loss of world heritage status. Uh, after the uh, fourth grace here, this is the attempt to match the Liver building and the, um, uh, the Pierhead buildings, the three great buildings, which are really the icons of Liverpool, with a fourth um, quality of public realm, a canal, a narrowboat canal cut through to link the system into uh, the uh, most uh, pre prestigious parts of the city. A, a real mess, really. And then North Liverpool, which is uh, Peel Holdings' project for massive growth, 
that one would welcome in many cities, but in, in Liverpool is just the one city which has a very minor, very, very low growth rate. So one wonders what, uh, what will be achieved in a project like this, which we, is referred to as Shanghai on Sea by all critics. On the other hand, Liverpool has redeveloped its shopping centre in a really uh, a first-class project. Uh, this is Grosvenor Estates, which is, many of you will know is the Duke of Westminster, so it's sort of ducal money, but they put nearly a, a billion pounds into the new shopping centre and they have linked all the streets up into uh, the, the, the pedestrian network. So it is now a fully permeable, no, no mile project. Um, and although you have shopping on three levels here, it's open to the elements. There's a new park over the multi-story. Um, it's essentially a private realm, but it is public to all intents and purposes. The only catch is that it's, it's patrolled by what are called sheriffs to maintain that uh, quality and that control. So, um, a very, a real model project, 23 different um, building projects by 16 different architects. It's a really interesting uh, exemplar, I think, of uh, what could be done. And then Sheffield, um, the quotation that was used here was from Nicholas Pevsner, who described going to Sheffield in the 1950s and saying it was a miserable disappointment. But Sheffield is one of those places with the most to achieve, really. And it is concentrated on a very strong public realm strategy of three routes which cross the city uh, mm -hmm. and use those to, to build new spaces, um, new, new facilities, uh, and to create uh, both a green network and a pedestrian network that can link university to city centre, uh, a very successful project. And it has its share of new architecture, um, and it has another great urban splash project, which is this one, which is the old Park Hill Estate, which had been again emptied, but is this time to be restored as a mix of private and housing association projects. So a great example of a conservation project that uh, has been adaptable and allowed um, the new and old to, to mix together. And one which is relatively balanced in terms of its uh, personnel. More problematic, places like Birmingham, Leeds and Bristol, they had very good reputations for planning and urban design. They, I think, are suffering somewhat in the, uh, they suffered in the Renaissance era by failing to move on and to improve. Uh, Birmingham in particular uh, lost its way. It had a wonderful urban design section and planning uh, ethos in the uh, 1908, 19, uh, early 1990s, but it lost it in terms of essentially overdevelopment around the canals. Um, the, flat thrash of, the, the cold rash of tall buildings, um, which interrupted the, um, or what was already broken skyscape, and big buildings like this, which is a kind of, this is Selfridges, um, which my students describe as a Poco Roban, Poco Roban uh, disco top. Uh, and I think it's quite expressive of that in many ways. Um, one, perhaps a very interesting architectural statement, but as a piece of urban design, it simply turns its back on uh, all, all edges of this, all parts of the, of the public realm. So that was a, something of an own goal. Leeds did it with very poor control of its, uh, uh, of its apartments. It had probably more ha apartments per capita than anywhere else, um, but it simply lost its ability to control uh, the communal space and the relationship with the street. So, uh, and also any kind of um, attempt to make, uh, to create, to, to respect, if you like, the, the brick traditions of, of Leeds which was very strong until uh, the 1990s. Uh, along the canals, you had a certain amount of uh, more modest attempts, but elsewhere, um, and particularly in the university, um, some very uh, problematic high-rise buildings. The high-rise buildings policy was an ex post facto thing, and it had no r real rationale to it. Um, and then the, th the third example um, of Bristol, um, Bristol, too cautious, really, perhaps too conservationist. Um, certainly, 
a, a public um, opposition to virtually everything. Um, and also no money because it was essentially a prosperous city. So when it got to the situation of finally saying we're going to have some new retail um, and the, with, the, with the recession looming, they, they, vote, they voted for this project, which is the worst kind of suburban multi-level shopping centre plonked down in the, uh, on the eastern edge of the city centre and it does not achieve what it, what it should have achieved. So that was a very sad uh, event, really, for a, a, very, um, a, a very progressive, what was trying to be a very progressive city. It does, however, have the first architect mayor who was, who was elected last, uh, last Friday. Um, so we expect great things of him as, in terms of putting back the ethos of good design. He's already achieved it in his uh, little projects around the city. How do we explain that variability? Well, I've given you some explanations for that, but I think the broader explanations are that you know, city boundaries are not consistent. Some cities are very different socioeconomically. Manchester is just a very small strip, um, so it doesn't have to worry about social housing, for example. Um, the, the spread of prosperity and disadvantage is very uneven. Also, inconsistent um, quality political leadership. It's absolutely critical to have that, to create stability. But many cities didn't have that. The planning committee versus officer relationship could be very difficult, and often was. Um, the executive on the council often didn't pay much attention to the planning committee. They would simply approve things in-house, and then the committee would have to rubber stamp that decision. So these were big issues, and the issues of the estates and economic issues for the city against strong planning, you know, get more floor space, get more development, those were the overriding factors. So all of those, I think, were, were significant problems. Um, the local development industry, in places like Liverpool and Manchester, they were superb. Small-scale projects, Urban Splash, Igloo, uh, for example, was a very sustainable developer. Um, those, in certain places, the local, and George Ferguson in Bristol, this local development industry doing small-scale conservation type, but increasingly large projects were innovative and were really important actors uh, following the Cade mantra. Um, and the public awareness and support uh, for design, was that really tapped? Well, it was tapped, but what we found was that uh, the more public awareness about quality of design, the greater the public opposition. So that, uh, that was a, a difficult issue to follow. And then the, the whole spread of funding was interesting. London got more than a, the lion's share with the on, oncoming Olympics, especially after 2007 when Boris Johnson took over um, and uh, central local political relationships uh, were somewhat changed. So um, that's, an, that's another factor, really. London is the exception to everything else in, in Britain, uh, and uh, it, it's particularly, particularly significant. So when we talk about design-led renaissance, what do we, what do we have to say? Um, I have to say in the first instance, which I should have probably put a slide on, these were the great successes. You know, some of the city's examples we've used, uh, the pedestrianization of city centers, the upgrading, um, the innovation of, of many development projects and conservation projects, all of those. But it was such a disappointment to those of us who are urban design fanatics, if you like, or academics, that I think I have to focus on what went wrong because it didn't achieve what, it, what we hoped it would achieve. The reasons for this were some of the failings of, of new labor itself. It's, it had what we call initiative, initiative-itis. You know, there are new initi initiatives every year, sometimes two new initiatives. And while they were trying to correct certain failures of things, then it, you know, it was not helping uh, the, the, the overall confusion. Maybe what New Labour needed was um, a scaled down project because the project they invented was a 30 year project. They should have thought through making enough gains to ensure re-election uh, when it came in in uh, 2010. So 
the micromanagement tendency didn't help, and local planning authorities were overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Then, of course, the neoliberal policies uh, to reduce the role of the state in housing uh, and social welfare kicked in as well, so that new labour was never going to be allowed, really, to start rebuilding uh, a council housing programme. A social welfare programme was cut. Um, everything was hived off to private finance initiatives. So it, was, it, was, it looked like the public books were being balanced. And that was a terrible move in terms of the quality of development. Uh, housing supply shortages, especially for poorer families, meant that gentrification was inevitable. The Rettelese said it always would be, but it wouldn't, didn't need to be. Uh, it negated the social mix aspiration, which was re very, very strong in the, um, in the Renaissance agenda. The plan-led system was slow to be established, and then when plans did start to talk about suburban intensification, there was a very strong reaction against it. So um, that was sort of that was part of the, the politics of the situation. Land prices escalated hugely, partly as a result of globalization, uh, but also because of potential profitability of development, which was uh, very significant. And local, uh, local authority leaders didn't take the long-term view uh, of new labor at, la at large. So they were, um, they were very short-termist in terms of quantities of development and were not particularly interested in, in raising the quality. The city centres, as I said, were favoured. The consumerist focus was something that worried Ivan Turek. Uh, that certainly came to pass. Uh, and what followed in its wake was a huge amount of hotel, retail, um, entertainment, tourist investment. So that the uh, iconic building and the, um, the, the, th the drive for development really took over. Local authorities were not um, organised or resourced to, to be placemakers. Um, it was much more difficult than we thought to get planners to work with highway engineers, to work with, um, to work with new design guidance, etc. Uh, the value of urban design campaign, which was a central feature of the K program, persuaded only a minority of developers and politicians that quality would pay for itself. Uh, and I think that's, that was a, a, a terrible disappointment, really. Urban Splash and people like that made a, uh, have made it, clearly made it work, but others were reluctant to go down the quality route. The speculative development industry continues to lack the quality aspiration. It's the custom niche built, rare but inspirational project that, that takes all the laurels really for development. London, as I've said, well, London is the exception because it's central urban renaissance is staggering, really. It's monopoly of finance and investment. It's the only place today where you'll see any office development. It's a complete exception. It's part of that primate city uh, element. It's a kind of neoliberal inevitability about it. But the house pri pricing of people out of London uh, is dramatic. And the confusion of placemaking pl and place marketing, which I've already alluded to, um, I think was uh, also a major issue. The icons, the consumer spaces, the urban competitiveness agenda were always working against widespread uh, regeneration with significant uh, potential for improvement uh, in terms of social mix. So those were the, uh, the key aspects. What has happened since has really simply put the nail in the coffin of um, the uh, urban design renaissance because the recessionary politics um, and the neoliberal and the neoliberal uh, pre-existing neoliberal element have meant that the, the, the design focus has been eclipsed by uh, a housing supply crisis, which is now very dramatic. If there were any demand, if people get, could get mortgages, there would be a huge outcry, but they, people cannot get mortgages. So uh, the, the production of housing has dropped remarkably by 50% from a relatively you know, a, a level which was already well below the required replacement rate. Uh, the state will have to underpin affordable housing provision, but the way that conservatives are going is they've cut the housing benefits and the pr uh, private, 
private rental supply has been given priority. They're in fact, they're moving people out of central London because they uh, don't want to pay the prices that the private rental market uh, insists upon. Um, the house builders have largely ceased production. Uh, they're waiting to rebuild their profit margins. Um, and what is happening is that all those planning permissions which have previously been negotiated with affordable housing, with community benefits, are being renegotiated and they're being halved or even further reduced. So it's a very difficult issue. But I just point to this, issue, this point here. Look what happened to land prices during the urban renaissance. This is what happened to house prices. Land prices went berserk. Something very different was happening. And partly that's driven by intensification, but I think it's also driven by globalization. So very difficult situation, and there's going to have to be a major reduction in land values, some of which you can see taking place. Design quality is still strongly supported by the Tories because it says, you know, good design is indivisible from good planning. It still says that in the planning documents. And the, the Tories have moved to really support the plan-led system. And I give them credit for that because I think that really important. Um, they've offered housing incentives to local authorities, but they have also opened the localism contradiction. So there is a new breed of localism, which is going to be a nightmare when it comes to suburban intensification. CABE has had its budget cut by 82%, so it is but a shadow of its former self now. Only the design review function is left, um, and that's, I think, it was a major part of where it began, but it wasn't a major part of where it finished up. Uh, so that was a really uh, bad. And then another uh, key agency, Design for London, that's had a budget cost of 62%. So it was doing a lot with transport and urban design. The anti-planning rhetoric has increased. Um, the positive action on poor performing authorities is going to take place. They'll be penalized. Um, garden cities are promised instead of eco cities to keep Rob Freestone very happy, no doubt, but um, you know, to see a return like that. Um, the Building for Life audits, which were telling us the quality was problematic, have now been eviscerated. So there's only 12 criteria now, and good sustainability is gone. Um, all of those things have, have taken place. And the, is there any local pressure for design quality? Well, it, when it comes down to trying to deliver it, it's really the design quality remains dependent on the client commitment outside of London. And CLG's grant, which rose very, very high by 2008, has now dropped by 74%. So we're back really to conservative figures, uh, as you might express, expect. So that's a pretty sad story. And I have to finish on at least one bright note um, by saying that the Olympics kind of proved to us that urban design could work. Uh, and I think it proved to the public that it could work on a, on a very, uh, very dramatic level. Uh, but of course, for those of us in the know, we know that uh, this is Lend-Lease um, and, uh, you know, where you have apartments with active uses, it's going to be 40% affordable uh, by the end of the day. Westfield is at the heart of the... Um, uh, of the Stratford project, and also that you know the master planning, uh, Bly McNeil um, master planning of the thing was also done by Australians. So there's a big boost to Australian urban design. The question for for uh, the UK is, what will be the Olympic le legacy? Will it withstand the cuts? Will this, what was promised to be something to drive the re regeneration of East London, will that really take place? So that is an, that's an open question, really, uh, against, uh, against which we will uh, draw verdicts on the English urban renaissance. Thank you very much for your patience. So we're a little behind schedule here. Um, possibly just one question before the panel, the, the panel starts. Anything? For the moment, or would you like to delay it? Okay, we'll wait for the panel. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce Bill Rand. Bill, you at the back there. Bill
Bill Randolph is the Associate Dean Research and, uh, for Built Environment at the University of New South Wales. And he's also Director of um, City Futures, um, which is by far the largest urban research centre in Australia. Um, so Bill, Bill will uh, introduce the panel, who will come to the stage at this point. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Alan, for that, uh, that introduction. Um, while uh, while the, uh, the panel are assembling themselves and also uh, assembling their, uh, their microphones, um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, drone on for a little bit. Um, I'd like to thank John for that very, very stimulating and very factful uh, presentation. I think we all saw so many similarities with what uh, is going, has gone on in the UK and the similar things that are going on here in, in our own city and also cities elsewhere in Australia. Uh, and that suggests some communality of, of issues which should come out of uh, John's talk. I hope the panel would pick up on. Um, we do have uh, an august panel of urban luminaries to end this week of luminosity. So uh, if I can, I'm not sure if they're in the right order on the stage, but it doesn't matter anyway. Um, you will know these people because they're extremely uh, well known in, in, in Sydney and beyond, of course. Uh, I'll quickly introduce them by name. Then I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves a little bit, just to say what what, uh, what their particular area of expertise in relation to this uh, issue around urban design and, uh, and how it relates to urban planning. Uh, and to ask them to uh, just say one thing that they think uh, is going to be a critical issue about how we uh, improve urban design and integrate it with urban planning. And I think one of the points that I'd like to bring out this evening, we uh, have, have titled uh, the, the, the event, a little bit provocatively, we hope, um, is urban design enough? Uh, how do we retool our, the Australian cities? Uh, is to say, look, you know, urban design does one thing, but urban planning does, other, uh, does another thing. And yet, have, we have a system, we have a planning system which urban design has become increasingly an important, quite rightly, an important factor. Uh, can the two things uh, work in, in practice together. John's talk showed us how important it seemed to be, in the British case, to have strong government support, to have things working together, to have politics working together, to have the, uh, to have the market working with the urban design outcomes that were, 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 were desired. And where that started to fall down was where those things just weren't there. Politics were, were, were antagonistic. The market couldn't deliver the, the outcomes because it was too expensive or whatever. So can we get good urban design outcomes within a, a strategic planning system in the context of our current cities? Well, look, I'll quickly go through um, who we've got um, on the panel. Uh, we've got, well, starting from that's left, I think, left, uh, left to right, we've got uh, Peter John Cantrell from Zan's uh, Associates, uh, and Alec is here tonight, so he's keeping an eye on you, I suppose. Um, we've got Graham Yarn from uh, City of Sydney. Uh, we've got um, Peter Thallis from uh, Hill Thallis uh, uh, Architects and Urban, Des Urban Planning. Uh, we've got Emeritus John uh, Lang from our own Built Environment uh, Faculty. We've got Lucy Turnbull, who uh, is known to you all for all sorts of things, but she was, is an ex-mayor of, of the city of Sydney. And finally, John sitting at the end. So if you start from left to right very quickly, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what brings you here, apart from the fact that you were asked to be here, and the one key thing you got out of John's, uh, John's, John's presentation. Okay. So um, my name is Peter John Cantrell. And with my colleague, Philip Thallis, who's also on the panel, we've just completed a book called Public Sydney, Drawing the City. And that book indicates a key concern we have in the city, which is the creation and maintenance of a rich, vibrant, supportive, equitable, extensive, unambiguous uh, public part of the city, which will generate value 
for private development and for an enjoyable life in the city. And what I'm interested in is through comparative analysis, I think it's clear that Sydney needs to have the following, and it needs it rapidly and um, emphatically. Increase public transport, increase citywide density, accompanied by stopping the development of productive rural lands and the wilderness, and increased amenity in both our public and private spaces. Thank you. Graham. Okay, um, Graham Young, so I'm the Director of City Planning, Development and Transport at the City. That's about 275 people. And uh, I guess my brief is the strategic planning framework for the city, individual planning proposals to redevelop sites, the major urban renewal areas in the southern part of the city, which is often projects, I think, for the university, and um, how the assessment process applies a number of the things that were discussed uh, to tonight. And I guess the one thing that, uh, if you put it that way, I got out of your presentation is just how similar the tensions are between the issues uh, in the UK and in Australia and that um, the issue of confusion and clarity and leadership helps to break through ownership and involvement on certain directions. And so I'd like to come back to that question. OK, thanks. Peter. <coughs> um, it's going to be very hard for John to say anything new by the end of this, but um, uh, central, I think, to thinking about the city is the public interest, and particularly how the public space is made in the broadest public interest in the most inclusive way. And I think that that leads one to reflect on the topic and the schism in planning where the planning system in New South Wales actually doesn't recognise the public domain as a thing at all the streets, the public domain, simply are absent. There isn't a great city in history and there isn't a great city to today that isn't founded on its great streets, its great public places and the like. Yet that is absent from our planning because our planning is basically de development enablement or development suppression. And so it's completely uh, left out the thing which is most important, the thing most important to us, the thing that is actually the representation of democratic society itself the physical re representation, which is the public space. There are obviously a number of exemplars, and Alec did uh, implore us to be um, controversial here, so I will mention the B word, which is around the corner, Barangaroo, as in a sense a paradigm of all that is bad. And there are lots of English examples as well. And there's actually a very good book on uh, English contemporary planning uh, called Ground Control by Anne Minton, which talks about this mm -hmm. surreptitious privatisation of pseudo-public domains. And I think we're in the middle of that, if you look at uh, the old Carlton United Brewery site, and particularly Barangaroo, but in fact all up and down the harbour, you see pernicious examples of these sorts of tendencies. And of course in England, they're led by Australian companies. So plenty to talk about. John. My concern has always been with urban design per se, but it's been biased by the work that I did with the Environmental Research Group in Philadelphia for 20 years. The focus of the work was on developing design briefs for buildings varying from um, orchestra halls to psychiatric facilities to the rejuvenation of public housing. And uh, much of the urban design work was, working, was with community groups ranging from the wealthiest neighborhood in Philadelphia to um, very poor neighborhoods. And we had to deal with the differences in taste cultures so that in working in some areas, there'd be um, problems that I saw which the local community regarded as a solution. Okay. In doing this work, I became very concerned with the nature of theory and the nature of what works and what does not work. And in a, in a fairly abstract way, both in terms of process but also in terms of product. The problem with uh, my work, which has been criticized by people that I do respect, including one international figure who regards it as cute, um, is that it's not the way that architects work. Architects work from generics, generic ideas. And so my question or thought in terms of John's presentation was, was how do you turn policies into generic ideas which are multidimensional? We have lots of single um, variable um, generic ideas, but how do you turn them into um, generic models that are applicable across the board. 
Thanks, John. No, Lucy, just okay. a little bit about who you are. Okay. My name is Lucy Turnbull. I, quite a long time ago now, I was the Lord Mayor of Sydney. I've been out of city politics since 2004. Since that time, I've maintained a high level of interest in cities and urbanism in general in various roles. I'm very involved with the Committee for Sydney. I have served for the last couple of years on a COAG Reform Council advisory panel on, on cities and their metropolitan planning. I think my particular area of interest is um, the interplay between placemaking and urban design on the one hand and the city as a system on the other. And I'm very concerned that placemaking and urbanism has a strong connectedness and interplay to support and, and manage a lot of changes that are going on in our society, like technological change, of course, and innovation, to promote innovation and to make our cities a, a crucible for innovation. But also, on the other hand, to manage great challenges, like, you know, which we have been managing, I would say, not terribly well over the last decade or so, population growth. But I think the big sleeper is, and this is where urbanism and placemaking can play a very big role in managing the challenges of demographic change in an ageing community. So, although there are lots of similarities with the UK, my understanding is that the UK is not struggling to the extent that Australia is with population growth, especially in our larger cities. And I'm particularly interested in how those sort of systems interplay and macro forces interplay with transportation planning and economic planning as well. Okay, well, thanks. There's a, there's a lineup of, uh, of, of, of issues and questions which I hope you can get your teeth into as we go through the, uh, the next uh, Q&A session. Look, I'll, I'll kick off, if that's all right, uh, with, a, with a question I'd like to throw into the pot. And um, it, comes from, uh, it stems from a reading of John's uh, paper, which, uh, Alan, it's called uh, Urban Design in Central Sydney, 1945 to 2002, in progress in planning. I do recommend it. It's an extremely good paper uh, that John wrote after spending some time at UNSW in the early uh, noughties, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and you pick up a quote uh, from Long, uh, 1998 quote, where critique of the Melbourne Docklands, basically, um, and what was going on at that time uh, uh, in, in the Melbourne Docklands, which we've seen similar similarities with other cities in Australia. And he talks about um, the city of urban design and planning in Docklands creating the city of spectacle, footloose global capital, waterfront showpieces inhabited by post-industrial bourgeoisie. Planning becomes facilitating development with a bit of urban design thrown in to keep things nice. Ethics sacrifice to aesthetics in the global competition between cities. Now, that's uh, quite a, a damning d indictment of what urban design is and how, how planning has been turned into essentially a facilitation for development. So I suppose the question uh, I've got to ask the, ask the panel to get off, is, is urban design ever going to achieve anything other than just the delivery of the city of spectacle? And what role can we, 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 we see of, 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 of urban design in actually attempting or actually driving real change uh, in a planning process which is compromised essentially by the market. I think that came out of John's, uh, John's uh, presentation. So, urban design, what's, yeah. you, what's its use? Well, um, the assumption is that these developments of the city of spectacle are what makes the city. But in fact, when you look at the city as a whole, they occupy very little space. They accommodate very little numbers of people. They do occupy a lot of media and they probably occupy a lot of people's, some people's, prominent pastimes. So my first thought is that, in fact, it's a kind of distraction, this argument. And my second thought is that urban design, where it's valuable, is for the whole of the city, not for the, just these uh, small areas of speculation. And when you look at the whole of the city, there's a lot to do. There's, um, how to improve people's daily lives by making the quality of their housing better, as good as possible, which we saw some examples here and which we are seeing successfully in Sydney in comparison to Melbourne through the residential flat building design code. It's undoubted that housing quality has improved in Sydney in the last decade where it has gone backwards in Melbourne, for example. The second thing, of course, is that the quality of our public spaces particularly our streets and also parks, places where you spend your time, 
have been declining. They've been declining most notably since the state government abolished the Width of Streets Act, which allowed people to make streets narrower, with less trees, with less frontage and so forth. So um, the second area of attention, I think, is throughout the city in improving the quality of our public spaces. And of course, improving the quality of the public spaces increases the value of what fronts onto them. And that is, of course, the private development that drives the uh, sort of medium part of our economy. And so I think that's quite important. So I kind of don't really interact with your speculation in a way. Okay. But, but you, you raised the issue that, um, that I think uh, Lucy and Graham can comment on because they're involved in or have been involved mm. in the local politics and the local uh, governance of, of our cities very much so. That well, How much of all this really stems from government action up front, public intervention, public intervention in, in creating public spaces, in creating value, which then the market uses to drive the changes that we all are looking for. So, I guess at this point, I would try and make, I don't know if you can hear me, the distinction between, in a way, the product design question of urban design, the relationship between elements, and actually working out what the elements are. And, and the work that's been going on, I guess, over the last four or five years is trying to understand what is the economic underpinning of Sydney, for example, this city, um, over the next 20 to 50 years. We, we know it was wheat and it was sheep, and this building is a remnant of an economic underpinning which has now left this city, and in fact left it um, as a remnant that we can use for these talks. But that was a very powerful flow of, of finance and capital into the city and export. And we're in a totally different place. We've got, a, um, we've got to understand exactly what the competitiveness of the city is. We have to have a common ownership and understanding broadly by the community at different, in different levels about what that is and then apply that vision to the way we need to arrange the development of the city to deliver our ability to continue to prosper in that way as a city. And part of that is understanding exactly how every element of the workforce, including those who are not able to work, fit into that model. And I guess that's where the public transport question comes in because that's the future investment of that rapid public transport totally changes the affordable housing issue. Yeah. If you can access vast tracts of land out from the city centre quickly, it's that 30 to 45 minute travel thing. Yeah. At the moment, the inner city is very well serviced by bus and rail. So there's intense demand to be in there. It's brought the prices up, particularly for a city, a capital city, where we've got, say, 350,000 workers in retail and in finance industry. We're very well paid. So they want to live within 30 minutes, whether it's east or inner west, and they will fight for that market and raise those prices. But there's vast radial tracks beyond that, if only they were accessible more, much more quickly. And this is where public transport is the gift that government can give to the success of the oils of the city to work. If you leave it to the market, then you know, uh, gentrification housing will always outprice the hospitality worker who has to fold sheets in a hotel at midnight and has to live an hour and a half out of the city because of the poor public transport. So, but just, can't those, those people live in the city as well? well they, is that out of, out of, out out of the their question? budget? It's out of their budget if yeah. they're buying. But uh, if you go for rent control, which is the key worker housing initiatives that we're currently exploring, um, that does give them some prospects. But um, in the marketplace, it's a competition to be near the jobs that pay well. And that's why I say public transport is the answer to release far more affordable housing that we haven't tapped into. Well, we, we could have a whole evening on public transport. That's I'm sure we've all got our own stories. But Lu Lucy, as a politician or an ex-politician, perhaps you still are, um, how do you deal with this issue of, of, of buying, getting the community to buy in to the visions that we, we see for our city? Well, I think, I think um, we drastically need to undertake an analysis and, and um, develop better models for community engagement because there aren't enough people really engaged in, in um, the conversation about the future of our cities. 
just going back briefly to your comment about Docklands, I, I, I agree with you, it's not a, an unalloyed success, but I think to say that spectacle's always a bad thing is a little bit of a stretch too. I, I do, and our city has quite a bit of spectacle in it, natural and built spectacle, and I think that that's actually one of Sydney's great attributes. I mean, things like the Opera House, the Harbour Bridge, the Botanic Gardens, I can think of some fabulous office towers in the city, and that will be a personal value judgment. And just quickly um, uh, taking a little bit of issue with what you said about Southwark, I think one of the most exciting things about Southwark is actually the Shard. That is a, you know, very design-led, completely out of the box and completely off the scale of the horizon intervention into a part of um, inner but southern London, which is, which is part of an, a massive and I think very positive regeneration of that area where they're actually keeping the good bits, really, the, you know, like the, the borough market and all the good bits about Southwark, but they're, they're, they're loading into it some exciting dynamism of the future. And I think good place making and good city making is always about a strong balance between cherishing things that have, have value, like this, this pier, for example, to use a very good example, but also to take an imaginative and innovative steps to make our city better, not just to sit on our laurels and say, change is bad. We've got to adopt change, adapt change, and bring people with us. But there are parts of Sydney where, where the NIMBY, or, or even the banana factor, is a dominant one. Yeah. People who simply see the sorts of visions that we as planners and urban designers would see as perfectly valid, perfectly achievable, and the bananas get up and say, not here, not, he not here, not never. How do we bring those folks into this conversation? Because participation is, is a bit of a touchstone of, of, of planning orthodoxy these days, and yet we find ourselves increasingly difficult, uh, sort of more and more difficult to achieve that. Uh, want, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think that one, one way of doing it is actually to, and I, 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 I do this on an individual basis, but also in, in groups of people during that sort of coag discussion process and lots of other things I do. I think you actually have to stress the intergenerational equity implications of doing nothing anywhere. Mm. And I think that's one way that you can actually reach through to the kind of like the, the, the um, natural reflex of people to want in, to want nothing to change in their area because they're very happy with things the way they are. They, and you, if you put the question, well, do you ever want your children or your grandchildren to be able to afford to live anywhere near here, short of having, you know, really, really, a, a, you know, very, very, you know, prosperous life? If they have normal lives, they will never be able to afford to live here. What do you think about that? And that's actually a way of putting the challenge back to them to come back with why no change is ever a good thing. Peter, John, you were going to comment. No, I think um, a big player in this is the media. And I think the media concentrates on conflict and doesn't deliver education. And um, I think that's a really large problem. And we, all of us, are also part of this problem in that we need to be more articulate and more um, communicative in explaining why and how the city changes, but also ensure that that change is a beneficial change, is not a, a change that is seen as being negative. So Lucy's point is a very good point to concentrate on what the future of your city will be for all of those who come after you. And that we need to concentrate on how you make that future an attractive, reliable future. The other problem we have is a lack of good governance. And so it's very difficult at the moment to actually portray a picture of the future which is credible because, uh, in fact, we've been disappointed through a lot of governance and that any picture we portray of the future is actually not believed. You know, people don't believe there'll be a north-west rail link because there hasn't been one several times over. Yeah. People don't believe that increased density can give you increased amenity in your housing and a more enjoyable life because they've seen where more often than not, increased density hasn't been accompanied by better amenity and hasn't been accompanied by things that are better in your daily life. Yeah. So I think those are the keys, are actually communicating, first of all, agreeing amongst ourselves and others what the future of the city should be like, and then secondly, conveying it with um, conviction and with truth, how it can come about. 
They're the critical things. And if you don't do that, everyone should be a NIMBY because why would you want failure in your backyard? You, you wouldn't want that. What you want in your backyard is success. And, and that's what we have to aim at doing. Peter Salis, you, you've been a You've been part Philip. of a conflict. Is it Philip? Uh, is it Philip? Philip. Philip, sorry. Philip. Yeah, Philip. sorry. I, I thought My I was mistake, going there. Um, <laughs> you've been part of the conflict over certain key developments mm. in the city uh, and involved in the politics over that. What's your, what's your perspective? Well, look, we're all involved in politics. We're all here. You know, well, we're all true. citizens and um, we're all seeking this, this sort of engagement that, that Peter John's talking about. And I think we see a huge uh, range of. Uh, uh, qualities of governance from city council over a 20 year period uh, of fantastic leadership and we have so much to thank the city council for and its mayors um, to state governments which actually have been fabulous at various periods in our history and it's easy to to be completely negative about state governments uh, our state government but you know we are actually in one of the great urban projects ever realized in Australia if not you know of a global scale which is the reconstruction of the wharves by the Sydney Harbour Trust a state government agency the whole area resumed by the state government with the explicit aim of renewing the entire waterfront. And then the, the absence of the federal government. And this is a key failing and um, a failing of both sides of parliament with a, a couple of minutes of sunshine in the last 30 years. So we had building better cities for seven minutes in 1991 or two, when was it? And we were promised that again in 2007. It, it hasn't happened. You, know, you have to go back to Dirt in what, 1972 or something from your planning history. Where is the federal government in making cities and in investing in cities? Why can't we think about cities in a holistic way rather than having silos of each of these separate elements and discontinuities, dramatic discontinuities between the three tiers of government? Mm. That's just a complete failure of government. The it's John. a failure of what I'd call public imagination for what we could make the cities into. John, you've got a great deal of international experience here. This issue of governance comes up again and again when you talk about cities and delivering plans and what, how to make plans work. What's your experience of, of, of the governance issue in, in, the, in the international context that you've seen? Is it necessary? Is good governance absolutely critical? I mean, or can we get, a, get by without it? Because it's the sort of thing we may have to do here. Good governance isn't necessarily critical, but it's fundamentally important. <laughs> um, right. I think the other issue is um, of stressing what we have achieved. And we tend to be negative, and this is picked up by the media, and uh, everything is seen as going wrong. Uh, we need to stress what is uh, going well, both within governance and also within the projects that have, have been produced. And there is a lot of, there are many, many projects around the world which are highly successful in a multi-dimensional manner and we can learn a lot from them. I do believe that we do have a strong educative role and the ability to communicate what works and what does not work becomes very, very important. Okay. Well, we've all had a, a chat on the stage. I think it's time, uh, we've got half an hour of, uh, of the proceedings left. I think it's time for you guys to throw some questions to this panel and uh, perhaps get, get John to talk again as well. So. Uh, questions from the floor. I've got a microphone here. If somebody will come up and take it from me and give it to the people who are going to speak. Can we have a, a useful... Thank you, Andy. Good. It'll be turned on. So, can we take some questions, please? Just say who you are. Be nice. Hi, I'm Catherine Bridge. I'm from University of New South Wales. I'm actually part of City Futures. Um, I guess if we go back to John's um, first slides and he was talking about housing renaissance, I guess one of the things that obviously struck me in your slide was that the global financial crisis and, and um, funding and you know, the, the role of banks in financing and in development um, wasn't mentioned and yet that obviously correlated quite well with the downward slide. I would, I guess, like to open that up to the audience and particularly, I guess, the, um, the panel in terms of how important is that going to be for the development of the city of Sydney? Um, potentially, I guess, given that we've had a collapse of quite a large number of our housing um, and other building industry things more recently. Okay. Well, I'm happy to have a bit of a go at that. So, uh, <clears throat> 
funding for development's probably been the biggest squeeze on housing supply, actually, as opposed to approvals. Um, the um, valuations from banks, for example, have dropped by about 20% or maybe 25, which means every developer has to find 25% more cash to actually do the development than the previous funding models. Furthermore, any affordable housing components or other uncountable, where it's difficult for a bank to actually foreclose, they find it difficult to land on those components within market housing projects. So it is, the, the biggest impact has been commercial finance. The firms that internally finance, such as Meriton, for example, are able just to continue going ahead without actually having to deal with that particular, particular issue, which is much more common. So it's actually the biggest issue uh, at the moment in terms of starts. The City of Sydney has around 5,500 dwelling approvals that haven't resulted in starts, largely due to the um, valuation ratios that are being applied at the present time. John Punter, do you want to comment on the British? Well, it's exactly the same in the UK, only, only worse, I think, because our financial system is much much more at risk and uh, the government of course is um, feeding that in, in some senses but the collapse you saw in, uh, in housing production is exactly that. It's that people who are sure bets really cannot get a mortgage. Uh, young people cannot get uh, accommodation. So it's a, it's a criti absolutely critical issue and not only that but they are saying to us that this will not change for five, six, eight years. So what, what will be happening at the end of that period is you know, little short of, uh, well, you know, they'll all be moving back with their parents and maybe that will change uh, into generational attitudes rather quickly. Heaven forbid. Yep. I think it's also, um, it's good to think about the city as a much longer term place and thing than it is just today. So. Um, I'd recommend everyone go back to the 1970s and read Maury Daly's book, Sydney Boom, Sydney Bust, mm. which is a kind of classical um, thesis on the intersection of housing supply, cost of housing, and housing finance. And of course it has an ideological bent. It's really just a Sydney explanation of Engels' book from 120 years ago, The Housing Problem. And um, the housing problem is that, as Engels puts it, in a very ideological way, is that there's always enough housing, the problem is its distribution. And you can see this because Sydney, for example, has the highest square metre house size of any major city in the world. And our housing shortage is relatively, today, less than many other comparable cities. So a radical, impossible, ideological answer was, is just the redistribution of housing. That's, of course, impossible today. But um, given that impossibility, what has to happen is a very uh, difficult but focused debate on what are the roles of finance, government, and housing, and how do they intersect. And of course, that debate, I think, is actually completely hidden. And continues to be disguised. As Graham's implemented, in, indicated, state government, for example, will blame local government slow in approving housing. But in fact, the approvals are there. The banks will quite rightly say that they should be um, more fiscally responsible and that um, oversupply of housing was in fact part of the reason for the financial crisis and poor lending practices. In the United practices. States. In the yeah. United States. In the United States. But um, it's a kind of global question in a way. We suffer from that. So um, we do need to open up this debate, which is very difficult, and uh, to find solutions. And the other factor that's happening in New South Wales, which is also happening globally, is that uh, government has withdrawn from housing production almost completely. And a big modifying factor in past bust times in Sydney was production of housing by government. And um, that seems to be almost completely off the political agenda. And it seems that no one is willing to even raise it in a serious way. So it's, it's a very complicated but very 
centrally important question for the future of our city. Look, I think it's fair to comment, though, that Department of Housing are looking to double the dwelling numbers on their existing sites. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and it's... Not a very low base, but yeah. it's good. So, you know, things like Redford Waterloo, um, they're, they're actually got a, a, you know, a reasonable set of targets about the difference between market housing, social housing and affordable housing. We don't disagree, actually, with their breakdown and strategy. And um, so they are using their property to internalise and double the, um, the number of dwellings on, on their properties. So I just make that one yeah. caveat yeah, that's on that true. comment. Well, that implies, again, it's public action. I mean, we're assuming what will happen in Redfern and Waterloo will be a good urban design outcome. There will be good design which isn't driven necessarily by the uh, requirements to ensure profitability, although it, it has to well, stack up. Well, can I just up. say, I'm on the board of the SMDA, which you know is one of the, I guess, agencies involved in, in the Redford Waterloo project. I think what's really important with Redford Waterloo is that there, you know, this is where planning in a vacuum can often not be a great thing. The planning outcomes have to be feasible, feasibly delivered to be. If they have to be feasible to be delivered. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't undertake massive planning if the economics of actually delivering the outcomes, which is a massive transformation of, you know, a fairly so, a, quite a slow, socially disadvantaged part of Sydney, can't be delivered because you build all these expectations in the in the community that there will be this positive, you know, really positive good change, and then, you know, if it doesn't if it doesn't work, it won't happen, and that will actually feed into a sense of perception and actual disadvantage okay. going forward. So that is actually a really interesting challenge: is to deliver the outcomes that need to be delivered in Redfern Waterloo to create a more mixed, sustainable community in a, in a, in a good urban environment. Because it's quite interesting, I think the, you know, the mark one of the public housing in Redfern Waterloo was kind of like the Corbusian dream gone crazy. And so what you have to do is you know, modify and moderate the values in that dream and actually make it work as a community. Well, it's fundamentally important to make it work. Mm. And, uh, um, but to make it work, it has to be deliverable. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be feasible. <laughs> Another question. <coughs> Howard Tanner, I'm an architect. Um, it seems to me that uh, in Sydney, certainly at various times, there's been an enormous concern that we should improve ourselves. We should actually make a better place. And... Uh, in the history of Sydney, you can see those sequences. But at the moment, I have a concern that apart from some initiatives perhaps coming out of the city of Sydney, there is no, there is no plan that Sydney is going to be a better place in 40 years' time. It's that everything's OK. It'll just be more of the same. Well, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's plausible. We actually have to have some real initiative and something more than a four-year term to realise it. So how do you get there? Well, Back to politics. Yeah, I don't think it's that bad, actually. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you point to the city of Sydney. They are a leader in this area, but there are others that are following them. So I think that's really encouraging. The second thing is that this new government has, against all odds, against the advice of the Treasury, against um, lack of finance from the federal government, said that they will build the North West Rail Link. And at this stage, I'm convinced that they will build it. And so I think that's a turnaround and that's a, a positive turnaround. We have in New South Wales, as I mentioned before, better quality residential development because of state government um, policy action. And that's, that same state government is reviewing that policy action with the aim to improve that further. We also have a kind of important, um, positive, but also possibly dangerous um, point now where the whole of the planning regime is being reviewed and on the positive side will be made simpler and easier to communicate but on the dangerous side of course we're all um, scared of what we're going to lose. So engaging in that planning reform is one way of, um, as Howard puts it, concentrating on a better future. So um, you know, I think there's always bad things happening but it's always good to try to harness the positive things as well. And those positive things are not non-existent. They're there. I just say, Howard, I totally 
to some extent agree with what you're saying, but I think I can see signs that are more positive, you know, sort of over the last few years. For example, the Sydney Metro Plan, which was done in 2005, uh, took no, virtually no cognizance of the need for integrated tran transport and land use planning. It was, and that was for the, um, the fiefdom reasons that the then planning minister wasn't speaking to the transport minister. That was a very bad combination of events. So the impact of that plan was really sort of sort of still born because it, it, it was it, it didn't have it was an example of good integrated planning and and I think you know to some extent the 2010 plan and I hope the new Sydney Metro plan actually goes back to heal over that fundamental uh, mistake and um, I think that there is a better understanding that you can't just plan things in a vacuum they have to what I find very interesting is that there are these city centres outside the city which are developing like uh, Macquarie Park which Basically, I don't think were ever terribly planned at a state government level, but they, for, for reasons of land ownership by Macquarie University and, you know, I, I guess a, 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 a co-op, sort of like a helpful ride council, these areas, in terms of the, the workforce and everything, are starting to rival places like Parramatta. So, so these, you know, the city can grow and evolve and develop in a very positive way, not always with massive government intervention and guidance, and Macquarie Park's a good example of that. And I think we have to, in our planning, look at the things that are working well, not always with massive government intervention, and nurture those things, as well as having a kind of like a big strategic Napoleonic vision of what we want to do. Actually work with what's working. Start with that too. I think the other aspect of it, 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 it I agree with Howard, it's very easy to be negative, it, to look around. And one of the, the, the reasons Peter John and I wrote our book was actually to try to find a positive agenda in Sydney. And of course, one of the great things about positive interventions is they last, or they should last. And so Sydney, in fact, and if you look at the Metro Plan of 2005, they're building all the centres on the railway lines that were in fact built in the 1860s. Yep. Mm. And so what we've not had in, in the last 70 years is any commensurate public transport investment with the growth of the city. So you look back at 1940, there were something like 160 stations. Uh, less than 2 million people, less than half the urban area today. Since the war, we've built 14 stations, all of them on truncated lines. That's pathetic. So what we'd be expecting from a new transport plan, or a new metropolitan plan, is a long-term vision for implementing public transport that actually re-engages with a fabulous tradition of building public transport that we had in Sydney um, from 1860 to 1920. We were one of the best cities in the world. Remember also, not only haven't we built the, the railway stations, we ripped out one of the best trans systems in the world as well. What a stupid decision that was. It's important to reiterate those things. It's important also to re reiterate the things we've done well and the things that have got durable value. And I think this is one of the things that urban design can really focus on. Because it should be centred on the public good and the public domain, it should concentrate on the things that government can deliver or have a, a guiding hand in the delivery of them and the things that actually sustain our city. And that's, for me, a dichotomy with planning, which has become obsessed with development values. And that balance is what's missing. But it's been in evidence right, that, that dichotomy has been in evidence right through our city's history and most cities' histories, and it's very clearly shown in England today. We've got to learn from that, and we've got to articulate it, as Peter John says. Another question over there. Yeah, hi, my name's Mark. I'm a graduate of the planning degree at uh, UNSW and currently practicing in the city of Newcastle. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I just wanted to, I'm from a finance background and I guess my question is simply about lots of great ideas, um, but urban design's got to be paid for. Uh, so the tricky question is, is how would you pay for some of the things that urban design does, like a oh, better transport that. system and so forth? And I don't just mean the state government coughing up and taxpayers coughing mm. up. I also mean like, you know, should, uh, uh, I guess developers be taking a haircut, uh, you know, getting out of bed for more than or for less than 20 percent, you know. Um, but they'll tell you they are. <laughs> well, yeah, but okay, if they are, that's great. But let's uh, so let's hear some suggestions so, about how do we pay for so good what's urban the design. Proposition for yeah, good urban I think this is the, you know three extremely good questions so far, and this is a central question, mm -hmm. and it, it's quite a difficult question today because. Um, net benefit is calculated on net present value over a limited period of time. 
And um, so what that means though, is that um, things that produce a value quickly are more advantageous than things that produce value slowly and surely. And it's, it's a fraught situation and I'm not an economist, I don't know the way out. But what I can give you is a few examples. The Sydney Harbour Bridge would never be built under that economic formula. And in fact, Treasury advised the state government continually for 50 years not to build the bridge. Now, can you imagine economically the city today without the City Harbour Bridge? It would be a disaster. It would be nowhere near the economic powerhouse, in a way, or the economic success that the city is without that bridge. Yet, it could never have been built under that formula. The Sydney Opera House, would never have been built under that formula. The whole of the railway system mm -hmm. of Sydney would never be built under that formula. And in fact, that's why it hasn't been built in the post-war period. And that Cost railway benefit analysis. And that railway, Sword technique. that railway system enables people to get to work, to get to visit their friends, to all these things in the daily eye life of the city, but it enables Parramatta, Ryde, Bondi Junction, Hurstville, all these places in our city, Penrith, Campbelltown, it enables their growth. And it enables a growth that is unimaginable in economic terms in 1860. Absolutely unimaginable and unable to be formulated. And I could just go on and on. We wouldn't have Hyde Park. We wouldn't have most of the streets of the city so I guess wouldn't the, be 66 foot so, wide, so, they'd be 30 foot wide. So I guess the question cetera. is then back to you to formulate an economic model that actually would properly value this essential infrastructure on which the city depends. Well, can I, say, can I just say something there, just butt in? I think, I think the, the problem in the system at the moment is that there is a, a bifurcated analysis at the level of government because they have to worry about things like their credit rating and whether they're mm -hmm. going to be able, what their cost of borrowing will be, which is, a, which is a rational concern for them to have. So that they look at new infrastructure in a financial way and they look at it in the financial time horizon that they have, which is the forward estimates, which are typically, you know, four to five years, three mm -hmm. to five years, I think, you know, Not certainly no more than five years. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at, at, at any investment in infrastructure in a financial way without attaching uh, any, a, a sufficient value to the economic benefits of that investment in infrastructure. And that's, that's the weakness in the system. It sounds very arcane to divide financial cost benefit and economic cost benefit, but that's the missing, that's the missing piece. I mean, way back in the 1920s when they decided to build the bridge, which they'd been talking about for 50 years, so don't let's imagine that they got there quickly. Um, that that was, was first kind of proposed in 1812. 18, exactly. So, um, <laughs> but but that, that was sort of like a brave leap into the unknown. It turned out to be a really, really good investment. Um, uh, but now there's a lot more analysis because if you think about the investment in the Cross City Tunnel, that's you know, that, that was that was developed and created as an idea and an, an executed concept way after computers were invented. So what what went what went wrong there? What was that? What what was the problem there? Massive massive miscalculation of the traffic volumes because they had to make a, a quick return. So it's, it's just, it's a different, we are working in a different landscape. It's very hard for planners and architects and city, um, city administrators to change the economic system, but that's the environment we live in. We can try to shift it and shift people's beliefs and expectations. And that's a big job to do. But Lucy, why doesn't Treasury change its methods? Well, because they're looking to their credit well, I mean, I'm not in charge of Treasury, right, Philip? So, um, but, they, but they're looking across the forward estimates mm. and, and they, they look at an in investment or, or something like a, you know, cross city tunnel or a whatever, a, a new railway line and whatever they should be looking at in that, on that reasonably short time horizon in terms mm. of the financial costs. But surely there must be also historical economists as well. The, I'm going to go on. The other, the other thing we haven't quite done yet in, in Sydney or Australia yeah is actually create a good model for, um, for the government taking some of the, the cream off the l increased value in land, mm. which is a function of yes, investment in infrastructure, that, of what they call value, value capture. And that's a very vexed issue and it's not made any simpler by the, the, the complexity of our federal and state and local tax yeah. system. But yep. you know, in an ideal world, mm. they, they do it much more easily in other countries. But my question is more fundamental than that, in a way. Sorry? My question is a little bit more fundamental than that because okay. 
I've, I've read the Treasury advice on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and it's emphatically no. Don't do this. Mm. Quite emphatic. And um, I, I just, you know, as a non-economist, I can see, yes, if you apply this method of analysis, you shouldn't do it. But what I can't see is how you can make a city, like a metropolitan city, without these things, without railway lines, without bridges. Well, you, there's no argument. You can't. I You'll know, but, yeah. but all we hear is you can't. You know, the reason why the last government couldn't build what it kept trying to promise was that Treasury was saying, no, you can't. I think there is an difficult. exception, though, yep. and that is coming back to the strategic thinking about what's the economic underpinning of the city. There is one exception at the moment, which is the $1 billion investment in the renewal of the convention and exhibition facilities. One of the five streams, you might say, that will underpin the city in the future, business tourism. The economic modelling was done. The cost centres were done, the value to the city was done, the hospitality employment issues were looked at, all of those sorts of things, and the city and the state decided, while well, it's fairly penniless, that's the one thing, even though they were still functioning facilities that were what, only built in 1988, uh, that they would actually renew the entire package. Mm -hmm. So there's an example where that kind of level of investment... And that's all about competitiveness for other cities. ...has yeah. been taken on. So, while the, the, the other issue is generally true, um, you know, uh, now to get to you, the answer to your question, there are models where, for example, if a new rail line, high speed rail connection is put through which unlocks access to labour into the city quite quickly or more affordable housing situations, that um, uh, the rates associated with businesses within 400 or 800 square metres of each of the additional stations are uh, increased for a period of time and proportionally the residential rates are increased and it's split in some kind of formula that's reasonably equitable about what the ad added advantage is of that piece of investment but then that might only be a 30% contribution over the long term because then it's spread over multiple generations as well. So what the government does is carry the future generation component and share the current generation component with the current generation. But that's not happening anywhere yet. No, but that's no. happening in other places yeah. such as in the States. Yeah. Well, it'd be, it'd be interesting to ask John that question whether that was used at all in England. I mean, don't think Betterman taxes are new. Houseman used them in Paris. You know, why have we taken 140 years to even discuss it? But John, has it been used at all in England? <clears throat> well, abandonment policy was 1933 in the UK. You know, the Barlow report was all about about that issue, and it's something that we have never we've never taken forward. You know, you look at uh, the new towns, the Letchworth and uh, places like that, Welling Garden City. Mm -hmm. They've continued to make enormous amounts, significant amounts of money, which have been ploughed back into the communities, mm -hmm. and they have benefited hugely from that. Uh, it's simply that uh, the, a different kind of economic ideology has taken over. And, of course, that has intensified enormously in the last four or five years. Well, it didn't take long to get to the bean counters, but uh, it looks like that's where the source of the problem is. We've got one question at the front and one at the back, and that'll have to be it. We're nearly at the time. Can I go to one, Bruce? Do you want to go? Say again? No. Okay. Paola Favaro, um, involved with the University of South Wales in architecture and urban design programs. Just uh, looking at the John Panther's very informative uh, lecture, finished with a successful example of the London Olympic uh, project and development. So if uh, urban renaissance uh, can be historically explained in some ways as the uh, spirit, like the new spirit, uh, for the improvement of the city. I wonder if uh, only with special projects, uh, like a uh, special project where the, um, the focus is international and the focus is uh, like the Olympics or the Expo, just with this we can uh, achieve uh, what uh, John introduced at the beginning of the lectures are the four main factors uh, of uh, achieving a good uh, urban renaissance project. So you mentioned political stability, urban design framework, housing supply, and quality of the public realm. If uh, only 
on this spe specific uh, project or special project, we are able to achieve uh, all these factors. I wonder how can we learn from uh, this specific project eh, and make it that an uh, um, viable uh, venue for our cities? Well, I think, I mean, the point about the London Olympics was that money was no object in most senses of the term. <laughs> And when you look at how much money was spent, I forget what the figure is, is it $9 billion or something like that? It's a huge, it's a yes. vast sum, um, that the, uh, the amount of investment that was put into that project on the back of one or two other key decisions like Stratford and the, uh, the, the, channel, the channel route, the uh, link to France and to the continent and all of that, um, I think that most people feel that money was thrown at the Olympics and that the things that were produced, um, they're waiting to see how they actually materialize. The, the um, points that I made were that I thought that what Land Lease had built at uh, Stratford was a very good model for what needed to be built in the rest of the UK in terms of high density, um, apartment living that was also um, with good communal space and a good interface with the public environment. I think if I was to stretch it into what's good about Westfield, I would have a lot more difficulty because Westfield is essentially an interior design of excellence that externally leaves a lot to be desired. So I think that um, and, and when you look at the stadium, for example, it's quite obvious that we cannot convert the stadium to serve both, Olymp both, sport both athletics and football. Uh, and that is going to be a, a major problem for us. Um, the only other side of the, the issue is that we, put, we did put the Olympics in the right place. It was entirely right that it should go into the East End. And everything really hangs on whether the legacy of the Olympics actually benefits the inhabitants of the East End. And I think that's an open question. Really. There's a gentleman at the back in the red. Yeah. Uh, very brief question, I suppose. It's followed from a whole lot of stuff you said earlier. Oh. Uh, follows from a whole lot of stuff you said earlier about governments with their narrow thinking and bottom line thinking, and that's about all. Um, I suppose I phrase it as a question. Uh, in current government, what percentage are uh, accountants and lawyers and what percentage are architects and engineers? And is part of the solution getting a few more architects and engineers in there? <laughs> no, I think you know, the Politburo is in China's dominated by engineers. It and is, yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> hold that up as a good example of government. So I, I think it's kind of irrelevant. Well, they get things actually. done. And probably the more economists <laughs> and lawyers we have in government, the better that we are, because they have the skills to deal with these complex questions, actually. They have better skills for those things. Well, some. Well, some of them, yes, maybe some of them. And I would, but equally, I think there are places in government for people with design skills as well, and um, we have been lacking that in government, yes. Graham? Yeah, look, I'd just like to say, finish with two, two thoughts. One is that I'm much more optimistic about Sydney than most people are, and I think that you need to be dissatisfied in order to help propel change. But having said that, Sydney in 200 years has come from a colony not funded by an empire like uh, the European cities. It's come from, from nothing, really. And in those 200 years, it's now one of the te 10 top livable cities in the world. Yeah. And that is phenomenal really. I don't know what other examples there are. Other cities that have been around for 2,000 years are barely able to survive on a, you know, think of Athens, but are able to survive on a year-to-year on a -year basis. Um, and so I think we've done an enormous job, actually, with no finance, off the back of individuals who came here, who self-funded, and borrowed and eventually has created the city that we have. And secondly, you know, I think that through the stable government question, the city of Sydney, at least over the last decade, has relatively had a very um, outward looking and forward thinking approach. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think that there is a stable 
there, well, there is now a stable regime, you'd have to say, in this particular city, and, and a vision that is what has allowed its constituents to virtually buy into some very significant change. And you can see that along um, South Dowling Street, for example. Well, Coming back to the question that was asked, I do believe that there is, uh, it's very important to look at the design implications of policies. And there are many, many examples of policies in the verbal form which sound marvelous, but when they're put into place, um, the results have been um, not what was expected. And so in that sense, um, more exploration with architects um, of policies, I think it's very, very important on a continuing basis. And that's a call for more research, isn't it? That the, well, that's, a, that's actually a very good time good for me just to end the session, really. <laughs> Look, um, I'm sorry, Bruce, we'll, we're, past, uh, we're past 8 o'clock, and, um, and, and the drinks are all lined up at the back. I can see them, uh, and some people are already clutching theirs. So, look, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, thank the, the, the panel very much. Peter John Cantrell, uh, Graham Yarn, Philip Thallis, got it right, uh, John Lang, Lisa Turnbull, and uh, John Punter, our star guest for tonight. So, please, hands together. <clears throat> um, my, my last a bit of run out of, uh, bit of run out of questions. I was going to ask you, how are you going to do good design in South Granville, which has always been my bet noir about how are we going to plan South Granville. But maybe you can, we can join us over drinks and discuss that. Discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, right. indeed. Okay. One moment, please. <coughs> A message from our dean. Well, I. I'll be one minute. I'd like to just do two things. I mean, after this fascinating uh, exploration of uh, finance, politics, and city design, where I think we need to understand how they can integrate more effectively, how designers can understand politics and finance, and frankly, finances and people in governance and leadership roles can understand design, how we can integrate that better. After that fantastic discussion, I have the job of closing luminosity. Um, a week of activities which have, we thought, 3,000 people would be a bottom end, 5,000 people would be the top end. We've, we've, we've somewhere between six and 7,000, we think, and probably closer to seven. To uh, close luminosity, I'd like to um, ask Alan Peters to come to the stage. Uh, Alan has been the leader of luminosity, um, head of school, deputy dean, and a professor of planning. Um, he and his team have delivered uh, in-house this event, which is a, a great achievement and shows why UNSW and our faculty is quite distinctive. We really can say we're the only faculty that really focuses on the design, delivery, and management of the 21st century city and its elements. But we've tried to put it on show, and thank you for, for coming. But I'd like to thank Alan uh, for this achievement and ask him to say a few words. So <clears throat> I realize you desperately want to drink, but I've got to, I've got to thank a few people. Uh, the designer of this exhibition is an incredibly talented man who is one of ours. He's standing at the back there, Andrew Folks. Well done, Andrew. <clears throat> Supporting Andrew is the guy right next door to him, uh, Jeff Webster, who did incredible work this last week. Um, the core group also consists of the, of the following people, and because it could take a long time, I think I'm just going to read them out and we clap at the end. The core group were uh, Cassandra James, who did all the event planning for this, Laura Chambers, who did work on the web, um, on many, many words and on many, many programs. Liz Roberts, who did work on graphics and the schools program and the TAFE program. Uh, Zara Birch, who produced the catalogues. Uh, Claudia Maroon, my EA, who well, she managed me and she managed pretty much most things here. And uh, Peter McConaughey, our general manager, who made sure everything really worked. So for that core group, well done. Thank you. Thank you. 
There were a few other people, I'm not going to mention them all, but there, around that core group there are lots of supporting staff, including Catherine Brown, our development manager, Sam Sheridan, our alumni person, and uh, Barry Webb, and numerous other people, including the student representatives and program directors. I really would like to thank them all. Thank you. I think it's all over. <laughs>